Gaming started out in the arcade style. Simple, infinitely repeatable, and contextless. Held back by the technology of their time, early gaming involved honing a specific skill. Reaction speed, spatial awareness, aiming. The game would generate a challenge, and the player would react to it. Then games gained structure. Now there are levels, and a story, and an ending. This era displayed how quickly gaming technology developed, clearly visible from the graphical difference between games and this style. Everything from Half-Life to Disney's Hercules to Mario to Metro all fall in this category. It's extremely diverse, extremely broad, and quite hard to define, but there's clearly something different between this and this, even though the core of both of these games is fundamentally similar. So what's next, then, in my model of game design evolution? First came the rule-driven design, then the structure-driven design, so what's next? Well, if you ever talk about game design with me, something that I regularly force my friends to do, you know that I never shut up about it. It's system-driven design. This is a design philosophy that combines the rule-based ideas of early game design with the structure of modern games. These games build a world, a set if you will, and then build multiple independent systems on top of it. These systems are quite simple usually, often single loop-like progressions of logic. Then, the integration of sets of these systems creates great complexity that becomes the game. I think that this current point in video game history marks a long-winded transition of structure-driven games into a new design philosophy of systems in games. And to better explore this idea, I've decided to discuss what I believe may be one of the first games that began exploring the use of layered systems in its design. This is one part of a two-part analysis of Ubisoft's Far Cry 2. In this video, I will discuss how the game combines mechanics together to form one of the first real open worlds in gaming and how these mechanics would evolve throughout time to create the open worlds of today. In a second video, I will cover the story of Far Cry 2, how the central conflict between two murderous factions creates an interesting setting that explores how games might hold real messages built into their design, and ultimately allow Far Cry 2 to become something that is bigger than the sum of its parts. All right, man, I knew you were cool. We gotta stick together. The Far Cry series is one of my favorites. For these two videos, I've played every Far Cry game to date, and what's become abundantly clear to me in replaying these games is that the series has undergone quite an evolution. Far Cry 1 is not like any of the others. Developed by Crytek, this game shows some of the earliest signs of moving away from the structured design of AAA games of its time. Its inherent nature seems to point to this. The game takes place on a tropical island, there are fewer corridor shooting segments, and you technically freely roam the islands, but there's nothing here except the objectives. Really, it's Call of Duty in the tropics. It even retains some aspects of arena shooters with health and armor packs scattered around the levels. Everything is hand-built here, enemy placements are always set in stone. This truck will always appear here because its appearance is scripted. The only systems here are the players, shooting guns and gathering health and armor while fighting the enemy AI. Far Cry 1 is an entry that does not really belong with the rest of the series because it's fundamentally different from the rest. In fact, it has more in common with Crisis than with Far Cry 2. Which makes a lot of sense, actually, since Far Cry 1 was developed by Crytek, who would later, independently from Ubisoft, release Crisis. The Far Cry inspiration is immediately clear. The expansive tropical setting is maintained, and the eventual extraterrestrial themes remain. Crisis would go on to become a benchmark of what gaming graphics could look like. Big, beautiful natural landscapes and bombastic gameplay, which Crytek could deliver with the use of their CryEngine technology, taken out for a second drive now after trying the exact same things with Far Cry. Far Cry 1 is better classified as the first Crisis game. So this is the first thing we have to address, Crisis. Why did I pick Far Cry 2 as the first game to establish systems-driven design over Crisis? Because Crisis comes as close to that line as possible without ever truly crossing it. The open world is one of the clearest indicators of an attempt at systems-driven design, and it appears front and center in Crisis. The game has dynamic weather, AI, physics. Beating Far Cry's release date by almost a year, it looks like it should have taken the credit for introducing this new system-driven design. But while Crisis really seems to be a systems-driven game, it lacks one of the two sides of this kind of gameplay. 
It has very dynamic and systems driven combat, absolutely, but then so do Call of Duty campaigns in many ways. And of course, it would be very difficult to argue that COD campaigns are an example of systems driven design. What makes Crisis and COD similar in a foundational sense as not systems driven games is their lack of a systems driven meta game, a dynamic design that happens between combat sections. When an enemy encounter ends in COD, a pseudo cutscene takes place where you perform a scripted or sometimes downright animated action or watch the other NPCs do so, then move on to the next encounter. No real gameplay is really occurring between fights. The game could literally take control of your character here and not a ton would be lost other than some immersion. At a most abstracted level, this game design does not change between Call of Duty and Crisis. Both games have dynamic combat sequences and both games lack a meta game between those combat sections. Crisis does its best to distract you from that fact with its wide open map and player directed travel, but the gameplay between combat segments involves not much more than running to the next combat arena and listening to radio chatter. Far Cry 1 is the same at its heart, and being a predecessor of Crisis, it's even easier for this illusion to break, as every enemy in the open world is pre-positioned in the path that the player is expected to cross. Veer off even slightly from that path, and the thin veil falls apart. The islands are empty. You are in a combat corridor. The freedom is fake. All repair crew, we have inbound damage. After Crytek's Far Cry 1, the series never goes back to this level of linearity, never becoming explicitly linear. But after Far Cry 2, the series begins to turn around towards linearity again, because Far Cry 2, like 1, is a fundamentally different game to the rest of the series. This is because Far Cry 3 was a runaway success. You are Rakyat. The incredible critical and commercial success of Far Cry 3 established a formula that Ubisoft would try to recreate over and over again. And for good reason. Far Cry 3's return to the tropical island was accompanied with an incredible writing effort. Coupled with a downright historic performance from Michael Mando as Vas Montenegro, this game is a must play for any core gamer. Far Cry 3 was fantastic. That is crazy. The first time somebody told me that, I don't know, I thought they were bullshitting me, so boom, I shot him. The thing is, <laughs> okay, he was right. But Voss left big shoes to fill for Far Cry 4, and the massive sales numbers meant that a massive budget was put behind it. 4's Pagan Man did just that, perhaps not as iconic as Voss, but just as memorable. A new setting evoking images of the mountain ranges of Nepal gave the game a new but familiar setting, and the new resources available to Ubisoft after the success of Far Cry 3 were put to use creating an incredibly expansive game. But the similarities were clear. Far Cry was now a game about its villains. Whereas Far Cry 2's Jackal was a nondescript middle-aged man who quoted Nietzsche, Voss, Min, and Seed are all highly memorable, highly eccentric, and highly iconic characters. They directly embody the enemy in contrast to the Jackal's indifference and remain in contact with the player throughout the game. Towards this end, the intense focus on their characters means that these later games became more linear, much more story focused, and decidedly less systems driven. Fuck you. That leaves Far Cry 2 in a strange place. It doesn't follow up its predecessor in any way but name, who seems to fit in much better with a different series entirely, and is left behind and overshadowed by the momentous success and popularity of its successors. A moderate success of its time, its odd new ideas were confounded by the omnipresent bugs and completely overwhelmed by a few mistakes. But this timeline leaves Far Cry 2 as one of the first examples of fundamentally dynamic game design in a major AAA game, a game ahead of its time in a way that left it forgotten until its cascade of influence began to become known years later. Far Cry 2 starts out with you losing the game. 
Before the controls are handed to the player, their mission is a failure. Their reason for flying into Africa is already made irrelevant before the tutorial is complete. The assassination target, Jackal the arms dealer, knows of your presence before you even check into your hotel. By the time you lie in bed writhing in pain after catching malaria, the gamification of the events around you has already faded. The Jackal mocks you and escapes. The game is over. The target's presence in the state continues to be a stabilizing influence. He's largely responsible for the recent influx of weapons into the country and clear violation of the joint signatory framework. His reputation as a dangerous arms dealer is well deserved. Orders are to terminate. What is left around you is just the scraps. As this gamification fades, the real Lebo Asako comes into view. The game leaves you aimless, replacing what might have been directed mission by mission based gameplay with just tossing you into the country. But being left aimless is a critical component here. When the game starts, you are just another foreigner who didn't realize what they were getting themselves into when they came to this country, and now you must live here. As such, a systems-driven design becomes a necessity of sorts. A linear structured approach would simply not capture the themes of the story. It was necessary that the gameplay become more open-ended. Since the player needed to define their own experience, the game needed to respond to player choices and actions. In short, the game needed systems. So every aspect was systematized. The base combat system was complicated by its surrounding systems of condition, ammo, and weaponsmiths, which then intertwined themselves with the objective systems, which then intertwined themselves with the travel system, which then intertwined themselves with random encounter systems, and so on. The end result is a game that approximates the life of a failed assassin embroiled in a civil war, making friends, making enemies, gradually descending into work as a mercenary, gathering favors for you and your friends, ambushed as you attempt to complete a task to further your interest, planning and executing an assault on an enemy position. first-person shooting in the Far Cry series is one of the few constants. The shooting becomes just a bit less spongy with every entry, guns become just a bit more satisfying with every entry, explosions a bit more impactful. Thankfully though, by 2008, first-person shooting mechanics had modernized enough, perhaps because of the influence of Crisis and COD, to still stand the test of time well enough to not be a massive deficit. The selection of weapons in Far Cry 2 is large, but in the way that is unique to the franchise even to this day, each small set of weapons served its own role in combat. The mainline rifles serve the same role throughout the game, but they are not to be confused with each other. When you first enter this conflict, the G3 is the rifle of choice. Provided en masse to both sides for dirt cheap prices by the Jackal, it is plentiful, it is dangerous, and it is absolute garbage. Its sheer prevalence reinforces this. Every soldier carries one of these, and you quickly acquire your own. Then, as the conflict drags on, the AK-47 becomes more commonplace, just as unreliable, but packing more stopping power. You quickly adapt, buying or scavenging your own to keep up with your enemy. Soon enough, if you eavesdrop on the conversations of one faction, you become aware of a newly sourced and distributed weapon by the Jackal, the FAL, a serious weapon. As it becomes adopted by the factions, the danger of encounters increases, only to be matched by the power of your own weaponry. As the conflict draws to a climax, modern AR-16s appear, a deadly weapon that forces you to adapt to the new danger once again. That escalation was just the rifles, one of the many weapon roles in the game. Shotguns undergo a similar progression, from what are essentially hunting guns in the beginning of the game, to a much more dangerous SPAS-12, and finally an endgame devastating USAS-12, a fully automatic shotgun that rips through cover and clears outposts and seconds. Another progression exists for long-range snipers, and two extra additions exist to further complicate matters. A silenced MP5 completely changes your approach to combat, allowing for complete stealth to become a viable option, and an endgame grenade launcher allows for just the opposite. Each weapon is in the game for a reason. Weapons that serve the same role in combat are differentiated by their role in time, when they appear and become widely used, changing the combat in the world gradually. In the secondary slot, a set of pistols is the first choice. The puny Makarov evolves into a capable .45, and finally the beast of a gun that is the Eagle 50 cal, a weapon so fun to shoot that I often chose it over better primaries just for the experience of wielding it. Automatic sidearms eventually evolve from the Mac-10 into the Uzi. Then a few specialties, a silence pistol for those only half-heartedly dedicated to the stealthy lifestyle, and the grenade launcher, access to semi-consistent explosion. A flare gun acts as targeted fire for distraction. Then, one of my personal favorites, the ultimate in ambush weaponry, IEDs. Instead of hiding behind a rock with a rifle to intercept the target convoy, I can just rig a bridge and watch the fireworks.
finally the specialty slot, two progressive machine guns with incredible firepower, and two rocket launchers for creating chaos, an early sniper rifle and a flamethrower, and a mortar? What the hell? Then Molotovs and grenades, a machete, and three types of mountain guns on all kinds of vehicles. Finally, the Fortune Edition brings another set of three unique weapons to the game. Every single weapon serves its own role and has its own playstyle. A flamethrower will allow you to flush out enemies from inside wooden structures, while you can take out your mortar to the top of a cliff and play god. But just a thoughtful system of weaponry was not enough for Far Cry 2 because systems must be built on systems. Buying weapons involves traveling to a store and purchasing them from a catalog, with currency earned from missions and exploration, then picking them up in a warehouse. Access to new weapons in the shop comes from performing uh, corporate sabotage on weapons and forks of your dealer's competitors, yet another system to add to the pile. Weapons have durabilities too. I know many players, including some of my friends, dislike weapon condition, but I think that they can often add a level of improvisation to gameplay. When a key weapon jams or outright explodes in the middle of combat, you must frantically make do with suboptimal gear or scavenge one on the spot, keeping encounters dangerous. In some other games, I feel that players feel cheated and disappointed when they lose weapons that they like, but Far Cry 2 solves that problem by making the weapon shop's warehouse a system in and of itself. Weapons purchased start out in perfect condition, unlike weapon scavenge from enemies, and they can be infinitely replenished in the warehouse. The game allows for dynamic and frantic moments in gameplay while never taking the toys away from the player, at the same time having them plan trips to the warehouse to keep themselves armed, furthering the feeling of being a mercenary. The distribution of this gear is also more complicated than it might appear. New weapons become adopted in the arsenals of the various factions as the war progresses, but their timing is very precise. A player who is on top of keeping their gear up to date will have small periods of exclusive use on their weapons when their guns outclass the previous gear of their enemy. But then, soon enough, the factions catch back up and the world feels as though it's acting in response to your actions. Really, it makes sense. Your dealer can only give you new weaponry as they enter the country, and the supply must be filling a demand larger than just your own. Something good for both of us. These bastards from Moldova, they think they can walk into another man's home and steal his business. The moments of brilliance in the weapons distribution occurs when you come across a particularly valuable weapon. Weapon rolls are designed to fit around each other. Automatic secondaries act as a main gun for the grenade launcher or sniper rifles, pistols to back up a more traditional primary, machine guns to give you something reliable while you experiment with less versatile primaries and secondaries. But the game knows this too and uses it to create even more memorable moments when it spawns a single low durability end game weapon randomly for you to find in safe houses or on enemies. Suddenly you are given the choice to take a powerful weapon and potentially upset the balance gear you collected from the warehouse, leaving you vulnerable in one area and powerful in another, eventually creating a frantic moment of improvisational gameplay once the weapon breaks, leaving your equipment unsuited and unbalanced. The distribution continues to be a point of critical importance in the game as we consider the vehicles. Three different mounted guns exist on a variety of different vehicles, allowing you the choice to either continue on with what you have, confronting tasks head-on, or stepping back and preparing by gearing up in a specific way and collecting the correct vehicle and equipment for a certain plan. There is another vital point to understand. These choices are not explicit. You are at no point shown a task list in a quest menu showing you the options you might have to approach a certain challenge. All of this is dynamic. You might not even realize that you're making a choice, and it certainly wasn't a scripted plan of approach by the devs. If you scout out a certain position and suddenly realize that you could easily attack it with a mountain gun from a cliffside, then go out and consider different cars and guns for the task, it really is you deciding the plan. That's the power of systems driven design. It's not a choice like in a game such as Deus Ex or Dishonored, where there are many linear paths to choose from in a combination. Don't get me wrong, those are good games, but they're less systems driven.
Menus in video games are kind of distracting, right? In some games they're fine, where immersion really isn't that important, like in esports titles for example, and in some games they downright make sense in the context of the game itself, like in RTSs. But in games where immersion is an important part of the experience, the fewer menus the better. As I mentioned earlier, the experience of living as a mercenary in this country is paramount to the overall experience of Far Cry 2, meaning that immersion must be maintained to maintain that experience. This game recognizes that, and avoids its menus like the plague. Shopping for guns? It's not a menu, it's a computer screen. Ready to pick them up? You head next door and actually arm yourself off the wall. Repairing your car? Pop the hood and get to work. Wanna know if it's damaged in the first place? You turn around and look at the engine to see if it's smoking. If it is, the color of the smoke tells you just how damaged. Durability on your weapon? You can tell by the rust on the gun. fast traveling, pick your station on maps in the actual world. Wanting to check your map, you actually pull out a map and a compass to plan out your route to your destination. Huh, this is uh, becoming a theme on this channel. When you have an active objective, road signs dynamically change color to reflect that mission objective, something that I only noticed many playthroughs in. If the compass starts to pick up a signal, you pull it out and use your camera to triangulate the source of the signal. Going to bed, set your watch manually. Accepting a mission, you listen to the debrief, then take the file in the game. The only real examples I can think of where the game does resort to a menu is like the save menu. The only regret I have is that your objectives only show up in the pause menu. Would have been nice to see those on the map somehow. But even the main menu isn't really a menu because it's an open notebook chronicling your adventure. Systems-driven games are defined by their systems, obviously, but the best examples of such games are those where the fundamental design philosophy matches the moment-to-moment -moment game design. To show you what I mean, let's look at another game, Mountain Blade. The first thing that struck me when I first played Mountain Blade was the camera. It's not floating in space. Consider a normal game, look at how the camera moves. This isn't how your head moves. It's too mathematical, it's too smooth, it's too stable. Not that this is a bad thing, I sure as hell wouldn't want to play an FPS where my camera moves like my head would, because I'd have to constantly tilt my head back to talk to NPCs, but there's just something incredibly satisfying about getting shoved around in a chaotic medieval clash. You see, instead of being a camera with animations overlaid in front, Mountain Blade puts a model into the world and ties your camera to the front of their head. So when you get knocked off a horse, when a mace smashes into your shield, when you join your army in assaulting a castle, your camera experiences all the real forces being applied to your character's head. It frequently doesn't look perfect, but it brings a wonderful sense of realism and being tied to the world. Far Cry 2 does not go this far, and fair enough, it's an FPS, but it does go further than some other games. Driving these large trucks through the tight dirt roads between the valleys is an amazing experience as your head bobs up and down reflecting the ground surface. Ever been in a car with tight suspension when you go off-road? The feeling of being jostled around is mimicked surprisingly well here. This dedication to the basic design philosophy is how Far Cry 2 achieves its great feeling of being in control as the player. It is a philosophy that mimics the systems very well. Ever notice how your camera snaps back into place when you're driving cars in other games? It's done to line your camera back to the front of the car. In Far Cry 2, you constantly have full control of your head. A tiny change like this, leaving more control for the player, leads to an absurd amount of increased immersion. Keeping tracks of enemies, seeing if you have to stop and fight or if you can keep going, switching from the driver to gunner seat mid-chase, turning around to check your engine as you try to make a mad dash past the checkpoint. It's another intersection of systems. Moving your camera, a most basic and expected system in another game, is used in this game to further complicate the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. It's so perfectly done that I have to wonder if shooting a sidearm while driving was a planned feature of this game. Considering just how many encounters here start when you are in a car, I think that it would have been a brilliant feature. The actual mission design of Far Cry 2 is pretty simple. The country is divided into two sections. 
Lebuasaco in the north and the capital of Bovaseco in the south, unlocked in the second half of the game. Missions are divided into different categories and can be completed in any order. There's the main missions and the underground missions, delivering passports to locals in return for malaria medicine. There's gunsmith missions, favors for the dealer in return for access to new product. Satellite towers are scattered around the map and you can interact with them to receive an assassination contract in return for currency. Listen very carefully. There's an available target opportunity. Proceed to the objective mark of the map. Terminate the target. Standard payment in rough diamonds will be transferred to your account on completion. Then there is a set of buddy missions that is intertwined with the buddy system. After picking your character in the beginning of the game, the rest of the cast is scattered through the country. You can meet them by rescuing them from militias or finding them wounded through the game. A set of foreigners like yourself, they're all mercenaries trying to advance their own position. You can do buddy missions for them to increase your history with them. Your best buddy will offer you alternative ways of completing main missions. Your second best buddy will rescue you in combat if you die. Based on your actions with each buddy, their positions will Will shift around, and if they are killed in combat, they're killed permanently. They congregate in Mike's bar, and that acts as their main base of operations. Unfortunately, especially for a game like this, missions are typically quite simple. Drive to the objective, clear out the enemy, kill the target, slash destroy the target, slash find the target. That being said, the game is more about the tribulations that take place in doing all these tasks, but a modernized mission system would be an incredible addition to such an intertwined game like this. Of course, having contracted malaria at the beginning of the game, you must continuously keep your medicine supply full to combat your symptoms. It's yet another system, and one that extends beyond the immediate consequences to combat. Symptoms during battle are much hated, but having to plan for collecting more medicine among the many other goals you might have is yet another way the game forces you to make plans and to adjust and improvise as you play. The final outcome is this. With a clear schedule, you head into town to accept a mission from one of the two factions. The UFLL have been blackmailing a neighbor for medicine shipments in return for natural gas. Prosper Kwasi wants the deal to fall through, so he hires you to blow up the gas reserves. Debriefing payment. As you turn to leave, you get a call from your buddy Marty, asking you to meet him before driving to the border. If you decide to hear him out, he fills you in on his own plan. He's planning on collecting a bounty on the head of one of the commanders of a UFLL militia being held on a train, but the men are being held back from any encounter at the command of a certain mid-level UFLL insider. He wants you to help him do this, kill the insider, freeing up the troops. The gas reserve explosions at the railway cause a distraction, forcing the newly freed soldiers, with their commander, to come out of hiding, turning the train into motion and heading east to the oil site. There, Marty will set an ambush with a detonator, destroying the train and killing the target. By the time you catch up, Marty will have confirmed the kill and you help him fend off the remaining soldiers. The mission was clear, go to the train objective, blow up some gas tanks. And that really is all there was, you could have done just that and completed the mission. But with an intersection of systems, you get a much more interesting mission with multiple moving parts. During the same task, any myriad of other things could have happened too. Maybe you assault the ranch of the UFLL insider with an armored truck. To get it, you would have had to go searching for it. Maybe you got ambushed on the road there. Maybe your arsenal wasn't fit for the task, so you planned a trip to the gun store at some point in the progression of this mission. This is exactly the goal, creating your own tasks by planning around the various systems in the game. If you're not sick of the phrase yet, this is systems-driven design. Far Cry 2 is all over the place now. Not in a direct form per se, as it is now an old and somewhat obsolete game that hasn't aged very well in some areas. Its shooting can be unsatisfying, its missions can be repetitive, and its unwavering determination to force you to spend a huge chunk of the game just driving from place to place make it quite unpalatable in some ways. But its ideas are being adopted across so many modern titles. The open world, a now seemingly default part of any new game. The addition of RPG elements into games which are traditionally linear and deterministic, the ideas of player freedom in game design. It may be that Far Cry 2 was a pioneer to these concepts, or it may be that the game was simply at the forefront of an emerging new type of thinking within game designers. Either way, it was one of the first to embody these design decisions. Let me be clear, I don't think that Far Cry 2 is the best game ever. It has great moments, and you should consider playing it, but there are plenty of good critiques of that game. As I hinted at earlier, the malaria mechanic was hated by players, seen as an unwelcome distraction in the middle of fights 
the mission design can be repetitive and the systems often revolve around missions that have you clearing out an area. The driving system seems to be consistently most cited critique of the game. This map is clearly created to be a set of corridors connecting open areas, leading to very, very long sections of driving. I personally think that all cars should have been 20 to 30% faster, with this buggy maybe being up to twice as fast as it is today. Seriously, the systems here are not always good and they often clash with each other in ways that do not improve the game. The enemy patrols became more annoying than fun and respawning enemies in the outposts mean that you get shot at even when you're in the middle of a long drive across the country to get to some other objective. Far Cry 2 is definitely not the best systems driven game, but I think that it's still important as a very early example of one. It's easy to imagine that predicting the future is a simple task. Looking back, the first home consoles were coming out in the early 1970s, and by the end of the decade, multiple models had already become quite popular. We, sitting here in the future, note that these consoles would eventually take over the gaming scene altogether, replacing the dominant arcades, but, well, Street Fighter 2, the third best-selling arcade game of all time, was released over two decades after that, in 1991. It's not possible to easily determine which technology or which new idea will become dominant in the future. Just like the home consoles would eventually replace the arcades, bringing about the dominance of rule-based games for new structured game design, it will be difficult to spot the juvenile concepts that will become dominant in the future. But that being said, let me put in my vote for the systems-driven game. One where the designers create a world that dynamically rules itself, mimicking the real world in that the decisions present therein are not scripted or predetermined. <laughs>